Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to uh, present the uh, new seminar, which is the seminar of uh, Professor Jeffrey Hill. Uh, I would like to thank you, Jeffrey, for being here, for presenting in uh, our list of seminar. And uh, I present, uh, I start, uh, first of all, I present uh, the, our list of seminars, which is uh, Economic Modeling Seminars. Economic modeling seminars, uh, we started with uh, uh, Robert Pindyink in uh, December the 1st. Now we have uh, Jeffrey Hill. After that, uh, we will have uh, on the next Monday, uh, Professor Vart. After we have uh, uh, Professor Bergman on February. Uh, the next seminars we are in our list are um, uh, Richard Toll uh, on, in the end of January and uh, uh, Professor Christian Gollier. Uh, this is the, uh, more or less the idea of uh, our seminar, but uh, we will continue with uh, other seminars uh, uh, for the next month. Uh, these are called the Economic Modeling Seminars, organized by Italian Association of Environmental and Resource Economists from the uh, University of Brescia, from uh, Fondazione Eni Enrico Mattei, and in collaboration with the uh, Euro European University Institute, uh, University of Siena, and uh, the Department of Environmental Science and Policy of the University of Milan. The idea of the seminar is uh, a pathway. The pathway is uh, for, um, about the most eco important economists uh, in the world that are uh, speaking about uh, political economy, especially about the presentation of today. They are economists about energy, environmental economists uh, that are in the top ranking uh, um, uh, list of uh, our ranking of the most important and influence uh, economists in the world. And they're speaking about uncertainty, which is one of the most important element, especially in, in this time, you can see in all the presentation that we have, we are speaking about a disaster, catastrophes, and so on, especially in these days. Social is one of the most important effect of the economy. And uh, another important element in welfare, welfare is uh, in two of the uh, titles of uh, present presenters that are all related to an idea. The idea is uh, sustainability and environmental economics. All these pathways will converge uh, to the uh, next uh, conference of, of uh, Italian Association uh, of Environmental and Resource Economists that will be in uh, uh, April, at the end of April. Uh, but uh, now I present uh, um, our speaker. The speaker is uh, Professor Jeffrey Hill. Professor Jeffrey Hill is a Donald Wade Professor of Social Enterprise and Professor of Economics, Economics and Finance, the other school of Columbia University, and a Professor School of International and Public Affairs. The topics of research of Jeffrey are economics of natural resources and the environment, economic theory and mathematical economics, regulation and increasing return, resource allocation under uncertainty. Which, are the, which is the research of uh, Professor uh, Hill. Research is uh, uh, explained in uh, uh, hundreds of papers, uh, more or less are, are about uh, 200 papers. Um, they are in the top journal that are Review Economic Studies, American Economic Review, American Economic Journal, Journal Economic Perspective, Journal of Public Economic, Quarterly Journal of Economics, Research and Energy Economics, among others. The list is very, very long because uh, Jeffrey has uh, produced a lot of papers in the top of journal. There are also books, uh, 18 books. Uh, uh, among these, uh, there are um, and dangerous economics, uh, valuing the future, which is one of the most important in my mind, because uh, we are speaking about uh, which is the future and the value of the future, which is related to another important word uh, that is uh, uh, behind uh, all this uh, long uh, list of uh, uh, seminars, that is sustainability. Uh, sustainability is also in other two books of uh, Jeffrey that are, uh, is economic growth sustainable? It was, was an important uh, question. And a uh, uh, book that uh, was uh, edited by um, uh, Fondazione Enrico Mattei, that is sustainability, dynamics is uncertainty. Uh, Jeffrey Hill is uh, um, one of the most influential authors according to the ranking of ideas. Uh, ranks among the top uh, list that is uh, about uh, environmental economics, energy economics, and resource economics. So it's very important uh, to have uh, Jeffrey here. I thank you again because he's uh, uh, one of the most important uh, economists in the world about uh, these topics. On the awards, also in this case, the list is very long, but I, I take uh, some also to give uh, the idea. Past president of the Association of Environmental and Resource Economists, uh, that is uh, 
uh, the first uh, association of environmental resource economy be before uh, European and it's also before Italian. Best paper in 2013, uh, European Association of Environmental Resource Economists, elected member, United States National Academy of Sciences. Other things are related to outside activities that are UK Department of Environment, uh, consultancy in this, uh, US Federal Energy Administration. He worked also for World Bank, uh, was a member of Academic Advisory Board of the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, coordinating lead author working group, uh, uh, second working group of uh, inter intergovernmental panel of climate change, uh, uh, and climate change IPCC, from uh, uh, 2010 to 2014. Now, I uh, would like to thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey, to be here, and I leave the floor to Jeffrey, and uh, thank you again for this. Thank you, that's great. Let me uh, <clears throat> start to share my screen. So thank you very much for your kind, inv kind introduction, and thanks very much also for the invitation to talk. Um, you know, I was visiting you in Brescia only 10 months ago in February. It seems like a totally different world now. It's amazing how much the world has changed in the last 10 months. And uh, that in some sense is what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to talk about the political economy of COVID-19, specifically in the US. Um, my co-author, Shihan Kui, he's a graduate student who's working with me at Columbia, Lulu, is uh, a postdoc working with me at Columbia, and Howard Kunreuter is a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, <clears throat> so let me give you, I'm gonna start with some background, I'm gonna give you a formal model, uh, and then I'm gonna talk about some empirical estimation of the formal model, uh, and uh, then some conclusions. Um, the background, I think you all probably know the background because uh, everybody else has been strongly affected by COVID-19. Um, a number of what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs, have been introduced to try to control the spread of COVID. Um, and those are typically either stay in place policies or shelter at home policies or policies about wearing masks. Um, in most countries, these policies have been introduced at federal level or the equivalent of the federal level. So the national government has, has mandated either a shutdown, a lockdown, a stay at home policy <clears throat> or the wearing of masks or possibly both. That's true obviously in the UK, it's true in France, it's true in Germany, Korea, Japan, China, many other countries. The US is rather unique in this respect. The federal government has taken no official stance on the kinds of policies that should be implemented in order to uh, restrict the spread of COVID. Um, the US leaves the choices of policies to the states, which means that the governors of the states, who are actually quite powerful people politically, uh, these governors have to make the decision on whether their state should adopt a stay in place policy or a mask wearing policy or not. And um, <clears throat> the point is that this leads to important interactions between states. And in particular, it leads to uh, what in sort of game theoretic terms or IO terms, industrial organization terms, we think of as strategic complementarity in the policy choices between states. Um, the impact of stay at home policies or stay in place policies are substantial. Obviously there are big economic costs. I mean, here in New York, for example, almost the minute a uh, shelter at home policy was introduced, uh, about 350,000 jobs were lost um, because the entire sort of hospitality sector, which is a big sector in New York City, closed down. Restaurants were closed, cinemas, theaters were closed, Broadway was closed, um, hotels were closed. And between them, they, 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 they threw about 350 to 400,000 people out of work almost instantly. Um, so there's a very high economic cost to a shelter in place or to a lockdown policy. <clears throat> but obviously there's a benefit, which is that we hope it will reduce the spread of the disease. And then in New York, for example, as soon as the uh, a lockdown was introduced back in March, um, the sort of reproduction rate uh, the, the, uh, you know, the number of people whom a single infected person infects dropped from about three to less than one. And that has big implications on the spread of the disease and significantly reduces the rate at which the disease spreads. Um, now, the important point is that the, the costs and the benefits can spill over to other states. And that's where we get this strategic reinforcement in, in, in policy choices. Uh, for example, <clears throat> the costs of the lockdown in New York uh, immediately spilled over to our neighboring states. You know, to the south, we have New Jersey, to the north, we have Connecticut. Many people in New Jersey and Connecticut work in New York. As soon as businesses in New York closed down, 
that many people in both New York and both Connecticut and New Jersey lost their jobs. So some of the uh, some of the costs uh, that, uh, that resulted from the New York policy actually spilled over into adjacent states. Um, the benefits also spill over to adjacent states as well, of course, uh, because if, pure, if the disease spreads less rapidly in New York, then given the interactions between New York and its adjacent states, uh, the disease spreads less rapidly into those states too. Uh, so the costs and benefits are not confined to a particular state. They spread over into adjacent states and indeed sometimes beyond adjacent states. There is, for example, a lot of travel between New York and Florida. A lot of people from New York have homes in Florida, summer homes, winter homes in Florida, <clears throat> and travel down to Florida for part of the winter. As soon as the disease started spreading in New York, uh, then many people from New York left to go to Florida. Um, and that's one thing that spread the disease down there. So things which rest restrict the spread of disease in New York can actually benefit a state which is as far away as Florida as well. So this is one of the reasons there's interactions, inter important interactions between the states. Um, <clears throat> this slide actually just says the same things I've already made, same points I've already made. Um, there was also, of course, some cooperation between states in purchasing. Uh, the federal government not only didn't mandate any particular policies, didn't mandate a shelter at home policy, didn't mandate a mask wearing policy, it also did a very poor job of providing uh, the equipment needed to deal with COVID-19. Uh, so it provided, it did a very poor job of providing uh, personal protective equipment and masks, face shields and so on ventilators and so on. So the states got together and cooperated in purchasing these. So there was like a coalition of Northeastern states, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Delaware, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania. They formed a coalition uh, to help to purchase personal protective equipment, uh, to purchase other equipment needed for hospitals in order to deal with COVID-19. Um, so there is complementarity between policies in, 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 relaying, in adjacent states. Uh, <clears throat> So what we're trying to do here now is construct a model, a uh, simple game theoretical model, which captures this, this complementarity between state policies uh, and look at some of its uh, consequences. I'll go through that quickly and then I'll, um, I'll, do some, I'll show you some empirical work which tries to estimate certain aspects of this model. So we've got uh, a number of different states. Each state is denoted by a subscript I. <clears throat> state has to choose a policy, little si in, in, a, in a set capital S, and, and the set of possible strategies is zero or one. Zero is not having a policy, one is choosing a policy, and that policy might either be um, a mask wearing policy requiring masks to be worn, or it might be uh, a shelter at home policy, a stay at home policy, or a lockdown policy. We assume that the policy that's payoff to any state depends on its own strategy and those of all others. And we denote the policies of other states by S sub minus I. So the S sub minus I is a vector uh, of the policies of all states other than I. So it's a vector of zeros and ones for states other than I. And state I's payoff is some function of the, the choices of other states and its own state and its own policy. So it's a capital S minus I and little si. <clears throat> now we assume, and this is the key assumption in this paper, this is equation one here, um, <clears throat> there's a fairly strong form of complementarity in the policy choices between states. Let me explain uh, sort of high level what this equation, this assumption is saying. So on the left-hand side here, you've got the payoff to state I, uh, you've got the change in the payoff to state I when it changes its strategy from zero, which is here, to one, which is here, okay? So we're looking at the increase in, the, in state I's payoff when it goes from having no policy here to having a policy, uh, let's say a shelter at home policy here. So this is the payoff to state I from implementing a shelter at home policy, when all of the other states are doing S prime. This is the same thing, the change in the payoff to state I from going from having no policy, this is here, to having a shelter in place policy, that's here, when all of the other states are doing S minus I, not S prime. And we assume that S prime is bigger than S, S prime minus I is bigger than S minus I, which means that in S prime, at least one state more has adopted a policy. So in other words, more states have shelter in place policies here than here. And this is saying that the payoff to state I in switching policy from no, from no shelter at home to shelter at home is greater the more other states have already adopted such a policy. Okay, so and it's greater uh, by an amount epsilon if at least one other state has adopted uh, a shelter at home policy. So we've got more, more states with shelter at home policies in the prime vector than the unprime vector, 
than the payoff to, to state I in changing from zero to one, from no shelter in place policy to a shelter in place policy is bigger because of that. So there's mutual reinforcement uh, and we look for the Nash equilibrium of this game. And um, <clears throat> this is what's technically called a supermodular game. It's played on a lattice because it's played on the zeros and ones, vectors of zeros and ones, which you can interpret as the, uh, the, the vertices of a unit cube in some appropriately high dimensional space. Um, and the uh, game of this sort has Nash equilibrium and it contains uh, the Nash equilibrium, which are Pareto ranked, it contains a greatest Nash equilibrium and a least Nash equilibrium. And in the, in the appendix to the paper, we establish conditions under which these Nash equilibria consist of everybody having a policy as, and, and, and nobody having a policy in place. Um, then we talk about what we call a tipping set. A tipping set is a subset of the players such that if all members of that, that, that subset choose strategy one, then the best response for any other player who is not in the subset is also to choose strategy one. So that's what's being said formally in the second bullet point there. If S sub I is equal to one for all I in the set T, then for all I that are not in the set T, UI of one and S minus I exceeds UI of zero and S minus I. So one is the best response. So a tipping set is the property, a set with the property that if everybody in that set chooses a policy, then the best response for every other state is to choose the same policy. So a tipping set can change from one Nash equilibrium to another by changing the strategies. In particular, they can change from a strategy from a Nash equilibrium where no or few people, few states choose policies to one where lots choose policies. Um, this is a very simple example. Uh, just to show that these things do exist. We've got uh, capital I players and each can choose either zero or one. Uh, the payoff to agent J of choosing one is equal to the number of other players who choose one. So that means there's social reinforcement in at the choice of one. The payoff to choosing zero is always zero. So you can choose zero or one. If you choose zero, you get zero. If you choose one, your payoff is equal to the number of other people who have chosen one. Okay, now it's clear that all zeros is a Nash equilibrium because if everybody chooses zero, then the payoff that everybody gets is zero. And if the, any, any one person decides to choose to change to one, it's the payoff is still one, still, still zero, so it's still zero. So there's no incentive to change. So choosing zeros is a Nash equilibrium. Um, choosing all ones is a Nash equilibrium because everybody chooses ones, then everybody gets a payoff equal to I minus one. If anybody chooses to which is to zero, they get a payoff of zero. And I minus one is bigger than zero. So um, all ones is Nash equilibrium. And the interesting thing is that if we're at the Nash equilibrium where everybody is choosing zero and one state chooses to one, changes to, chooses, uh, changes to one, then everybody else will also switch to one. So if we're at the Nash equilibrium where everybody's choosing zero, everybody's payoff is zero. And if one state then for some reason changes to one, the payoff to anybody else choosing one is now one uh, and one beats zero so everybody will change. So one state can tip the equilibrium where everybody's doing zero to an equilibrium where everybody is choosing one. So that's the tipping phenomenon that we're interested in here. Okay so um, we can prove some general results about this um, under the assumption that I gave you some assumption one there's a tipping set consisting of less than the total number of agents which will tip the smallest Nash equilibrium to the largest Nash equilibrium. That's the key, key feature of the results here. Um, so there's a subset of states that by coordinating strategies uh, on a state shelter in place policy, for example, can make it in the best interests of all others to follow suit. So there are potentially some quite powerful interactions between state strategy choices. And what we're going to be doing in the empirical part of the paper is testing this, testing to see whether there is in fact evidence of social reinforcement between states and of some, some phenomenon like tipping. Uh, so um, the whole issue of choosing these policies has become heavily politicized in the US, as I'm sure you've picked up from the newspapers. Um, and uh, democratic states are much more prone to choose uh, policies than Republican states. Republican governors appear to have a strong policy, strong preference for not choosing um, to put a policy in place. Uh, a lot of uh, Texas, which has an enormously serious outbreak of, uh, of COVID-19, has no official mask wearing policy. 
no official shelter in place policy. Uh, Florida, which had a very, very bad outbreak earlier in the year as a Republican governor, again had to was very reluctant, the governor that was very, very reluctant uh, to introduce a, a mask wearing policy and dropped it very, very quickly indeed. So Republican states appear to have a strong preference for not introducing policies uh, that restrict the spread of COVID. Um, so we can think about this as by differentiating the, the payoffs to states, depending on whether they're Democratic, which is uh, signaled by a sub-superscript D or a publican superscript R, obviously. I imagine the uh, payoff to a Democratic state uh, being uh, so additively separable in the actions of the Democratic and Republican states. Um, <clears throat> and um, a very simple example of this would be that the payoff to a uh, Democratic state I <clears throat> from choosing, let's say, one uh, or zero, would be equal to the number of democratic states choosing one or zero plus some number alpha which is between zero and one times the number of republican states choosing either one or zero and alpha being less than one shows that a democratic state is less heavily influenced by republican states than by other democratic states uh, there's less reinforcement which across the political band divide than there is within the political divide um, and um, if I sort of develop that model a bit further, uh, which we do in the paper, but which I won't do in the, in the presentation for reasons of time, we can show that there is a, a Nash equilibrium which all states choose, choose to have no policy, another equilibrium which all states choose a policy, as a, a shelter at home policy. There's a Nash equilibrium which all democratic states have a policy, but none of the Republican states do. There's a policy, there's an equilibrium which everybody chooses zero. And at that equilibrium, there's a set of the tipping set of democratic states which can tip the remaining democratic states to choose policies. So the equilibrium then becomes democratic states have a policy and republicans have no policy. And again, if you have a, an equilibrium where everybody has a policy in place, there's a tipping set of republican states so that if they choose to, to move away from having a policy, all the others will follow. Uh, so this, is, this shows that we can break the states down into democratic and republican, at least in principle, and uh, the democratic states have a big impact on democratic states and a lesser impact on republican states and vice versa. Um, okay, so that's the basic sort of theoretical framework. Um, let me talk about the empirical work that we're doing to, to try to test this and develop this. Um, so we're going to use a discrete choice model, probit model, logic model, linear probability model, to test whether the policies of one state do in fact have an impact on the choices of others. So we're testing whether the probability that a given state will choose uh, a shelter in place policy or a mask wearing policy. We're trying to see whether that probability is influenced by the number of other states of either Republican or Democratic orientation that have already chosen such a policy. Okay, and we're also testing for tipping. Uh, and we define tipping in a fairly obvious way. We say state in category A, which could be democratic state, republican state, a swing state, can tip those in category B to adopt a policy. And the policy could be shelter in place or wear a mask. If whenever the fraction of states in category A, which have adopted a policy exceeds some number X, then the probability of a state in category B adopting the policy becomes one. So in other words, we're saying that states in category A can tip those in category B to adopt a policy if uh, there's a, a fraction of the states in category A, which we're calling X for the moment, such that whenever the fraction of states in category A that have adopted policy uh, exceeds X, then everybody in, in, in category B will adopt the policy. Uh, the probability, in other words, the probability for people in category B of adopting that policy is now one. Okay, um, <clears throat> data on this is fairly easy to get. Uh, we get it from COVID tracking, tracking, COVID -tracking com. Um, that gives us the number of cases per state per day. We're using daily data, incidentally, daily data from uh, the end of February uh, relating to the every state in the US. Um, <clears throat> so the data comes from the data on cases comes from covidtracking.com. There's um, a CNN website, cable news network website, which gives us the data on uh, dates when mask wearing policies and stay at home policies were introduced or rescinded. And we also use population data, and that comes, guess, of course, comes from the uh, the U.S. Census. 
uh, we classify each state as uh, democratic, republican, or swing. And a state is a democratic state if it has two democratic senators, and if at least 48% of the vote was for Clinton in 2016, or alternatively, if it has two Republican senators and 48% of the vote was for Trump, that would make it Republican. Or alternatively, if it has one Democratic senator, and at least 50% of the vote was for Clinton. Um, and if a state is neither a Democratic state nor a Republican state, it's classified as a swing state. And we classify Washington, D.C. as a state. Uh, and so this gives us 16 Democratic states, 26 Republican states, and nine swing states. Uh, <clears throat> we, we try some alternative definitions of Democratic and Republican as well. The one we've adopted here is a pretty standard one in sort of political science, political economy in the US. We do try a couple more. It doesn't make any significant difference to the results. So this is not a, so the uh, interpretation of the results is not hugely sensitive to the precise definition of Democratic or Republican. This is the equation we estimate. Um, <clears throat> So on the left-hand side, we've got um, the probability that state I adopts a policy, which could be a shelter-in-place order or a uh, mask-wearing order. For the moment, I'm going to fo focus on shelter-in-place orders. So pi sub I t is the probability that state I adopts a shelter-in-place policy on day t. And day zero was somewhere back in February. Um, and we assume that that is some function of the fraction of democratic states with such a policy already in place on day t. The fraction of Republican states with such a policy already in place on day t. The fraction of swing states with such a policy in place on day t. The number of new cases, new COVID cases in state i on day t. And the number of, the cumulative number of cases of COVID in state i on day t, plus a constant, plus of course a, a random noise term. Um, <clears throat> NCIT is the number of new cases per 100,000 of population. Uh, this is the number of cumulative cases per 100,000 of population, and so on. Um, so that's the equation we're estimating, and we're estimating that using a, uh, a probit approach. So, of course, the, uh, just to remind you, I mean, the problem with estimating probabilities is that uh, we would like them to be between zero and one. And if I were just to estimate that as a regular linear regression, I could end up with probabilities that are negative or, or bigger than one, which would be uncomfortable in terms of interpretation. So what we typically do is we take a function of the right-hand side, uh, which is guaranteed to be between zero and one. And obviously the, the functions that we all know of, know and love that are guaranteed to be between zero and one are of cumulative density functions. Uh, so we take, uh, in a probit estimation, we take the cumulative density, normal density function of the right-hand side variables. Um, so that's what we actually estimate when we put this into stata and run the regression, probit and logit regressions in stata. Um, okay, so this is the uh, sort of table of results, or at least the first table of results that we get when we run probit and logit regressions. Um, probit, we're using the cumulative normal density function of the right-hand side uh, as the, the right-hand side variable that we're regressing probabilities on. Logit, we're using... Um, the log of the odds ratio. The log of the odds ratio, that's p over one minus p. Uh, and the log of the odds ratio is also a number which is constrained to be between zero and one. Uh, so that's uh, well behaved. Okay, so let's go back to this. Um, let's look at this first column here. This just shows us results for Republican states. And it shows us there's a significant positive coefficient on the number of democratic states that have already adopted a shelter in place policy. There's a significant positive coefficient on the number of Republican states that have already adopted a shelter-in-place policy. There's a coefficient which is positive but not significant on the number of new cases. Um, if I introduce the number of cumulative cases, this coefficient here switches to being positive, uh, but the coefficient on the number of cumulative cases is negative, uh, which I find puzzling and doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me. <clears throat> In the end, I dropped this variable, the number of cumulative cases, uh, because it doesn't behave well. And when you look at the data, it actually just is monotonically increasing over time, which suggests that in fact, it's probably proxying for a time trend. Uh, so I think the regressions which are interesting here are probably this one and this one, which don't have the cumulative data in them. 
So we focus on this one again. <clears throat> I've got positive coefficients, significant coefficients on the numbers of Democratic and Republican states uh, affecting the probability of a Republican state adopting a shelter-in-place policy. But I've got, for some reason, a negative coefficient on the fraction of swing states already adopting such a policy. If I look at the column for Democratic states, it's the probability of a Democratic state adopting a shelter-in-place policy is the left-hand side variable here. I got positive coefficients and significant on all of the other types of states. Positive significant coefficient on the fraction of democratic states adopting a policy. Positive significant coefficient on the fraction of swing states. Positive significant coefficient on the fraction of republican states. And a positive significant coefficient on the number of new cases. Uh, <clears throat> the pattern over here, when I look at the logic model as opposed to the probit model, is very much the same. The democratic case, so I've got positive significant coefficients on all three categories of states. A positive coefficient on the effect of democratic states on the probability of a democratic state choosing policy, likewise for swing states, likewise for republican states, and a positive significant coefficient for the number of new cases. For the republican case, again, it's positive significant coefficients of the fraction of democratic and the fraction of republican states. Uh, on the probability of a Republican state choosing a policy, but a negative coefficient again on the number of swing, on the fraction of swing states. So that's robust to both the, uh, the probit and the logit uh, changes in specification. So um, definitely support here for the idea of reinforcement. Uh, the probability of a Republican or a Democratic state is affected, uh, choosing a policy is affected by the number of other Republican or Democratic states, both. Uh, that already made such a choice. Okay, so there's, in principle, there's a, a support here for the idea that there's social reinforcement, because the probability of a state choosing a shelter-in-place policy is positively affected by the number of other states that already have such a policy in place. Now, um, because this is a, a, a low diesel logic and probit regressions, which are non, where the underlying equation is non-linear, we can't actually interpret these coefficients here as uh, orders of magnitude. We can't interpret these as the derivative of the left-hand side variable with respect to the right-hand side variable. But we can't interpret these as, as, for example, the A or the B or the C in this equation here. Um, we're estimating, actually, remember this equation here. And so the, uh, the derivative of the probability with respect to one of these rates here, the Ns, is, the, um, is this. It's alpha. If I want to take the derivative of PIT with respect to N, D, M, T, then it's alpha I times the derivative of capital Phi with respect to its arguments. Okay. And the derivative of the cumulative density function, of course, is just the, the, the normal density function, the probability density function. So uh, the derivative of PIT with respect to N, D, M, T is just little Phi, which is the regular probability density function for the normal. Uh, multiplied by alpha, and this has to be evaluated at uh, the uh, values of these variables here. Okay, so in particular, the derivative of the probability with respect to any right hand side variable, any independent variable, depends on the values of the other independent variables. So I can't just tell you what is the derivative of probability with respect to a particular variable. I have to tell you the derivative of that, of that der the derivative of the probability with respect to a variable conditional on the values of the other independent variables. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, what I'm doing here is exploring changes in the, um, the fraction of democratic states with a shelter-in-place order. That's N sub D SIPT, uh, and that's I'm clocking that up from zero to 68 percent, to zero to two thirds essentially, and I'm looking at how that affects the probability of a democratic state or a Republican state choosing an SIP policy. And I'm changing this one variable, uh, the number of democratic states with a policy in place, that's this number here. And these other variables, I'm putting at their mean values, the, the, the sample mean values, okay? So what you can see here is that as the number of democratic states, the fraction of democratic states with a shelter in place order increases from zero to two thirds, the probability of a democratic state, which does not have such an order in place, choosing such an order, increases from one third 
at uh, 92%. That's according to the probit estimation. According to the logit estimation, the numbers are slightly different. Uh, at when the fraction of democratic states with a policy in place is zero, then the probability of a democratic state which hasn't chosen a policy, choosing such a policy is 50%. And that goes up to 99% by the time we've reached 56% of the democratic states putting a policy in place. So we can see that the probability of a democratic state choosing a shelter in place policy when it hasn't already done so is strongly affected by changes in the number of other democratic states with such a policy in place. And as that number clocks up from zero to roughly 50%, the probability of a remaining democratic state choosing such a policy goes up from either a third or a half, depending on whether you take the probit or the logit, to one. Okay, and that, remember, is with the other independent variables set to their means. Um, one way of thinking about this is that we've got a, um, we've got four, four variables uh, on the right-hand side here. Uh, forget the constant for a moment. We've got four independent variables on the right-hand side. Um, so the right-hand side is a four-dimensional space. Uh, what I'm doing in that table I just showed you is I'm holding these three variables constant and taking a kind of a one-dimensional slice through that four-dimensional slice. Later on, I'll show you some diagrams where we can look at a three-dimensional slice through this four-dimensional space. It's actually a little bit more intuitive and a little bit clearer, but um, I'll get there in a, in a few minutes. Okay, so this shows you that, as I said, the... Um, probability of a democratic state choosing a policy when it hasn't already done so is affected positively by the fraction of other democratic states that have chosen that have already chosen such a policy. The probability of a republican state choosing a set shelter in place policy is zero and remains zero right throughout this exercise. Um, so the uh, republican policy, probably the republican, republicans choosing a shelter in place policy is not affected these changes in the democratic in the fraction of democratic states with the policy in place and is zero and remains zero all the way through and you have to shift the other variables away from their mean values to significantly above their mean values before the probability of a republican state choosing a mask wearing policy choosing a shelter in place policy deviates from zero now here's a uh, another table of a similar sort this case, instead of clicking up the democratic, the the, uh, the fraction of democratic states choosing a policy, I'm increasing the number of republican states. This is n sub r as opposed to n sub d. So this is the fraction of republican states with a shelter in place policy on day t, and it's going from zero to 53 percent. And this is the probability of a democratic state which has not yet chosen such a policy, choosing such a policy. And at zero, it's 62 percent. And at 53%, it's 98%. That's according to the probit estimation. Again, on the lo logit estimation, it goes up slightly faster, but not a lot. It starts at 60% and ends up at 99%. So again, this is showing that there is sensitivity of the probability of a democratic state choosing a shelter in place policy to the fraction of Republican states that have already chosen such a policy. But note that the fraction of Republican states, that the probability of a Republican state, which has not yet chosen such a policy, doing so is zero and remains zero right throughout. And again, that's because we're at the sample means for the other variables. Uh, the, 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 the three, as I said, there's a, the space of right-hand side variables is a four-dimensional space. I'm varying one of them, so I'm taking a one-dimensional slice through there. And the other three variables are set at their sample means. Um, now I'm setting the other variables at their maximum values, not their sample means, but their sample maximum. And again, I'm pushing up the, I'm playing with the fraction of Republican states with a mask wearing policy in place, N sub R. And I'm pushing that up from 0.07, 7% to two thirds. Now at this point, all the probability of a democratic state choosing a shelter in place policy is one, and it just remains one. Okay, it's maxed out. And that's because the other var other values, other variables at their maximum values. But the probability of a Republican state, which has not yet made a choice, choosing a policy goes from 0.01, 1 percent, uh, when the fraction of Republican states with policies in place is, is 7 percent, up to 99 percent by the time we've got two thirds 
with Republican states having a policy in place. Uh, so we're showing here that the Republic, when the uh, other variables are at their maximum values, other, other right-hand side variables at their maximum values, as you click up the uh, fraction of Republican states with a policy in place from essentially zero to two thirds, the probability of a Republican state choosing a, uh, a policy when it already hasn't already done so goes from essentially zero to 99%. That's on the probit estimation. If you look at the logit estimation, um, it goes to, to one more quickly. It reaches one at 57% as opposed to 60, 66%. Um, but in either case, it's clear that the probability of a Republican state choosing a shelter in place policy is affected by the fraction of other Republican states that have already done so. And is affected positively and goes up quite quickly. And that's when the other variables, there are maximum values. Okay, so that was all concerning the um, shelter in place policies. So I was the, the variable I was looking at here was the probability of a democratic or Republican state choosing a shelter in place or policy or a lockdown, if you like. Um, now I'm gonna do the same thing for wearing masks. So now this is the probability of state I adopting a mask wearing po a policy on, date, on day T. And this is the fraction of states with mask wearing policies in place. Uh, fraction of Democratic, fraction of Republican, fraction of swing states with mask wearing policies in place. Uh, otherwise the data is the same as before. This is the uh, basic um, table of results from the project and low bit mo logic models. Um, <clears throat> similar to before. So if we look at the, so here, if we, the first column here gives the uh, regression for the probability of a Republican state introducing a mask wearing policy when it hasn't already done so. And the coefficients on the numbers of democratic states, numbers of swing states, so the fractions of democratic states, the fraction of swing states, the fraction of Republican states with such a policy in place are all positive and significant. And that's true for democratic states too. Remember that in the previous case, this coefficient was negative and that coefficient there was negative, which I have a bit of a problem explaining to be quite frank. Um, now they're all positive, which makes good sense. Um, so both Republican and democratic states are showing a positive response to the introduction of mask wearing policies by other states of any category, any category at all, Democratic, Republican, or swing. Um, interestingly, if you look at this, this row here, um, in the probit and logit estimations, the number of new cases, COVID-19, is never significant. Uh, it's only significant once and that's in the linear probability model, but the linear probability model is not a preferred model because it doesn't constrain the probabilities to be between zero and one. And the two models that constrain the probabilities to be between zero and one, it is never the case that the number of new cases influences the probability of introducing a mask wearing policy. Uh, this is influenced only by the numbers of other states that already in introduced this. So the quick conclusion we get from just looking at this is that the um, Decision on whether or not to wear, to require the population of a state to wear a mask is really a political decision, and not a public health decision. It's a decision which is made on the basis of how many other states of a similar type or of a different type for that matter have already made that decision. And it's based much more on that than it is on the actual public health situation as summarized by the number of new cases. Um, so now I've done this to go, as I did in the previous case, what I'm going to do next is to go through um, <clears throat> showing you the marginal effects of um, particular right-hand side variables on the probabilities of Republican and Democratic states choosing to put a mask wearing policy in place. So here I'm going to vary the probability, the fraction of Democratic states which have a mask wearing policy in place on day T. I'm going to move that from 6% to 50%. I'm going to look at the effect that has on the probability of a democratic state without such a policy, adopting such a policy. And you can notice that in these three rows here, so the probability of a democratic state adopting a mask wearing policy is zero here, zero here, zero here. When the fraction of democratic states with a policy in place reaches 31%, uh, the probability of a democratic state 
which doesn't have a policy in place, introducing a mask wearing policy jumps to one third. Then he goes up to 0.85, then he goes up to one. So in just three rows, it goes from zero to one. So it's a very, very sharp jump in the probability of a democratic state without a mask wearing policy, introducing such a policy as the, num as the fraction of democratic states with such a policy in place goes from 30% to 40%. Uh, it's zero up to here, and it's one from here on out. So there's a very, very sharp change, much sharper than in the previous case, remember. And the same thing is picked up in the in the logit estimation. Um, in fact, it's even sharper over here. It's essentially zero here and here. It's 20% here, and it's one here. So it jumps from essentially zero to one in just two rows, as opposed to the three rows over here. Uh, so we're seeing what we're seeing here is a much, much sharper responsiveness of... Um, the probability of a democratic state introducing a mask wearing policy to the number of democratic states or the fraction of democratic states with such a policy in place. This looks more like tipping uh, than just a gradual social reinforcement. And in this case, the other variables are getting all set equal to their sample means. That's this diagram, this, this table here. Okay, this is <clears throat> the same uh, sort of thing. Now I'm varying the fraction of the Republican states N sub R M T, the fraction of the Republican states with a mask wearing policy in place on day T. And I've got the other variables set to their maximum values, not then their, their means, but their maximum values. And uh, probability of a democratic state choosing a mask wearing policy is already one and is maxed out at one. Probability of a Republican state choosing a mask wearing policy is zero when the fraction of, of Republican states with such a policy in place is less than 20%. As you clock to 20%, it goes up to 20%, and it reaches one by essentially 30%. So again, a very sharp responsiveness of the probability of a Republican state introducing a mask wearing policy in response to the fraction of Republican states that have mask wearing policies in place. Uh, remember that for the shelter in place policies, I started at zero up here, and I went all the way down to one down here, and the, the change in policy was gradual. It went all the way from sort of zero to one gradually over the entire range. Here, it's jumping from essentially zero to essentially one in just three rows or in just two rows over here. So much, much, again, much, much sharper response uh, of the mask wearing, probability of a mask wearing policy being implemented in response to the number of similar states with a mask wearing policy. Okay, um, this here I'm set and varying the number of democratic states with a mask wearing policy in place. Um, have I been through this one already? Yeah, this is just a duplicate, sorry, let's click skip that. So what is this showing us? It's showing us that there is social reinforcement in, between states in the selection of responses. It's clear from all of the coefficients in the various tables. What I'm gonna look at next in more detail is these marginal effects. And I'm going to, as I said, try to take a sort of a, a three-dimensional slice of that four-dimensional space of right-hand side variables. Um, so let's look at that. So what do we got here? Um, this one takes a bit more explaining. So on this, we've got three axes here, obviously. On this axis here, going from zero to one, I've got the percentage of swing states that have a mask-wearing policy in place. So I'm talking about mask wearing policies right now. This is the fraction of swing states with a mask wearing policy in place going from zero to one. This is the fraction of Republican states with a mask wearing policy in place going from zero to one. This is the probability of a democratic state which has not yet chosen a mask wearing policy choosing such a policy. And it goes obviously from zero to one. So this is the probability, so this is the left-hand side variable in one of the probit or logit regressions. It's the probability of a democratic state without a mask wearing policy choosing such a policy. It's being shown as a function of the fraction of swing states with such a policy and the fraction of Republican states with such a policy on the assumption that the number of the fraction of other democratic states with a policy in place is 18%, okay? And what you can see, then this, this, this shows you quite clearly something I was talking about sort of in a slightly hand-waving way a couple of minutes ago, which is that the, the response is much sharper 
than in the other case. So essentially what's happening here is if the fraction of swing states with a policy in place is low and the fraction of, of Republican states with a policy in place is low, which is down here, this is where both fractions are close to zero, then the probability of a democratic state introducing a mask wearing policy is essentially zero. If the fraction of other states with policies in place is close to one in both cases, if you've got, if you're up close to one here, um, actually this is, and you're up close to one here, then um, this is the probability is, is one. And it jumps very sharply from zero to one. And there's virtually no range where it's any, anywhere in between those. So if you go, for example, if we're, if we're here and uh, the fraction of swing states with a policy in place is let's say 0.5, you're starting where the cursor is now and you come in like this, then you suddenly jump up to here. So as the fraction of, Dem of Republican states goes from about 5% to 15%, uh, you jump from a probability of zero to a probability of one. So there's a very sharp responsiveness of, um, of the probability of a democratic state introducing a mask wearing policy to the combinations of other states that have already done that. And this changes as I, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to click up this number here. This number is going to go from 18% to higher numbers, and you're going to see this surface here move. Okay, so that's 18% of the democratic states have such a policy in place. That's 30%, that's 68%. So the 18% and the 38%, 30% cases are pretty similar, obviously. It's just that the relative areas are bigger, have changed. So there's a bigger area where the probability is one and a smaller area where the probability is zero. By the time you get to 68%, essentially two thirds uh, of the democratic states with a policy in place, then there's really no chance at all of a of a of democratic state not putting such a policy in place uh, the area where the probability is one virtually covers the entire space okay so you can see so what we're doing as i click through these things here i'm essentially taking you through a three-dimensional slice of that four-dimensional space of right hand side variables and you're seeing seeing how the the left hand side variable which is this vertical axis here you're seeing how that left hand side variable responds to the, the three right hand side variables Okay, um, so now I'm going to say the same thing for Republican states. So those were the, these were the democratic response surfaces. Now we're looking at the Republican state response surfaces. And you can see a big difference, obviously. So let me just compare this with, um, so this is, the, this is the comparable one, the democratic state. You've got a reasonably big area where there's a probability of one of choosing a mask wearing policy. Uh, and so again, I'm roughly half the space where you've got a probability of zero. Here you've got uh, most of the space, the probability is zero. There's no area where the probability is one. And this, and then here, the, uh, the fraction of Republican states with a mask wearing policy in place is already 34%. So this shows you that the, uh, this is, again, this is the same diagram as before, incidentally. This is the fraction of swing states with a mask wearing policy in place. This is the fraction of democratic states now with a mask wearing policy in place. This is the probability of a Republican state which hasn't yet adopted a mask wearing policy, adopting such a policy. And you can see that for most of the space, it's zero. Republicans really don't want to adopt mask wearing policies. Okay, and that's very different from these pictures here. There's really no value up I can put in here where the bottom, where this the surface clings to the bottom in the way they did in that red diagram, okay. I can click this up. And you can see that, um, sorry, uh, <clears throat> even when I push it up as high as 42%, and when I push it up higher than that, uh, the, the bulk of the probability is down at zero. So Republican states are clearly much more reluctant than democratic states to introduce a mask wearing policy. Um, and uh, there is no, there's really, when one third of Republican states have adopted a mask wearing policy, there's really no area or the probability of one of the remaining states adopting such a policy is one. And when it's up to 42%, there's just a small area around here where the probability is close to one. But again, the, the vast bulk of the space, the probability is zero, okay? Uh, but the transition between the two areas, again, is very sharp. This is a very steep piece here. So you're getting a very sharp response of the probability to the probability of the independent variable, sorry, sorry the dependent variable, the right, the left-hand side probability. You're getting a very sharp response of that 
to the changes in the independent variables on the, on the right hand side. Um, and I think that the tables I showed you before uh, indicated that there was a, a sharp response. So the bottom line is that there is a big difference here between the Republican and Democratic states in the probability of introducing a mask wearing policy. Um, and that pro probability is just much lower always for uh, Republican states. It's not zero, uh, but it is much lower. And it takes much, much higher values of the uh, right hand side variables uh, to push the probability up towards one. Uh, whereas for the Democratic states, it's, there's, there's always a significant probability of adopting a mask wearing policy. So you can see a sort of fundamental qualitative difference between the Democratic and the Republican states with respect to the mask wearing policy. But also what you see is that the responsiveness to mask wearing policy is very sharp. Okay, um, You've got a very sharp jump from you know, low probabilities to high probabilities. And that occurs also in the Republican, in, in the Democratic case, remember, again, you've got a very sharp jump from low probabilities to high, to high probabilities. Um, very, a very steep transition from the zero probability region to the probability one region. Um, very, very steep transition indeed. Let me just end by showing you the same diagram for um, <clears throat> shelter in place policies. So this is the same diagram for the shelter in place policies. And I, as I tried to indicate when we were talking about this earlier, um, this is a much smoother response. You don't get that sharp jump from zero probability to one probability. You get a gradual transition from low probability down here to high probability up here. Um, <clears throat> so again, this is the usual interpretation. This is the fraction of swing states with a shelter in place policy. We're talking about shelter in place policies now. Um, this is the fraction of Republican states with shelter in place policy. This is the probability of a democratic state, which hasn't already done so, choosing a shelter in place policy. And the fraction of such states, fraction of, of democratic states with a shelter in place policy is zero here. And I'm going to increase that fraction to 18 to 40 to 60 to 90%. You can see that surface remains a smooth transition from low to high probabilities, but obviously more of the space is high probability than low probability up here. So here, 93% of the democratic states have adopted a shelter in place policy. And uh, for at least half of this space down here, uh, the probability is essentially one that a remaining state will adopt such a policy. And there's really no region where the probability is zero. There's just a point over here where that probability is zero. Uh, when two thirds of the democratic states have such a policy in place, there's a, a smaller region where the probability is one but again, there's no region where it's zero. Uh, there are these regions around here where it's some in intermediate number. 43% uh, um, similar, but just slightly smaller area where the probability is one larger transitional area here. And 18%, that's where we started off. Uh, if there's a small area here. There's a there's beginning to see an area evolving here where there is a, a zero probability. And again, when the fraction of democratic states with the policy in place is zero, um, then, um, you get some region down here where the probability is zero, some region where it's up here where it's one, and a very gradual, very smooth transition between the two zip regions. Okay, uh, so that's the end of the talk. Um, and it's just after 11 o'clock here, just after five o'clock there, I guess. Um, so that's, I think, when Sergio wanted me to win. Um, so let me just try to summarize this. Um, we've looked at the adoption of various anti-COVID policies, non-pharmaceutical COVID policies by the states in the US, um, and try to understand what drives the choices of policies. Uh, and it appears that there's a very strong element of social reinforcement in the adoption of these policies in the US, that when the governor of one state is deciding whether to adopt a mask wearing policy or whether to adopt a lockdown policy, a shelter in place policy, he or she is very much looking over his shoulder or her shoulder at what other states are doing. Uh, that the choices that other states have already made is highly influential uh, in deciding whether a particular governor does or does not adopt uh, a shelter in place policy or a mask wearing policy. Um, and um, that the, it's, the, sort of these, the political element or the, the social reinforcement element uh, appears to be much more important than what one might call the public health element, which is the the number of new cases of COVID-19 in that state in the current day or in recent days. Um, 
There are differences between the Republican and Democratic states, particularly with respect to mask wearing policies. Democratic states are much more likely to adopt mask wearing policies than, Dem than, than Republican states. Um, but the, in, in both Democratic and Republican states, the transition surface uh, showing transition from zero probability to a high probability of adopting a mask wearing policy is very sharp, much, much sharper than it is for the shelter in place policies. So for those states, you've got this kind of policy, this kind of surface or this kind of surface, um, a very sharp transition. This looks like tipping. This I think is, is, is about as close as you'll ever get empirically to tipping. Uh, whereas this, sorry, this one doesn't really look like tipping. It looks like social reinforcement for sure, but not like a, 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 a sudden tipping phenomenon. So there is some evidence of tipping with the mask wearing policies, but uh, evidence of social reinforcement, but not necessarily tipping, uh, maybe more like a cascade with the, the others. Okay, let me stop at that point and uh, happy to take any questions that people have about this. Uh, let me. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Jeffrey. It was a very interesting uh, presentation about uh, COVID and, uh, and policy. And, uh, and also the role of uh, uh, the political uh, uh, the role of the political effect with respect to the health uh, public health considerations on the, the stronger result uh, in your presentation is about this now I leave the floor to um, uh, to some uh, um, uh, questions the first uh, that I, I call is uh, uh, Simone Borghesi with a as, as a question for you, and after I will uh, present other questions that are uh, in the list. We have Simone Borghesi. Nice to see you again. Yes, uh, and you're right. Uh, things change a lot since we last met. Amazing. We're living in a different world, aren't we? Exactly. That's true. Thank you for your presentation. It was uh, very, very interesting. I have uh, well a few questions, uh, but one main question I wanted to ask you. You show us that uh, there is strong evidence of self-reinforcing mechanism, and basically that given for a given number of democratic or republican uh, states, then you can compute the probability of adopting a, 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 a SIP policy, right? Yeah. Uh, now I was wondering whether you uh, consider computing. Uh, the impact of COVID on the decision of being democratic or republican. Basically, you could endogenize the number of uh, uh, democratic or republican states because I suspect that COVID changed elections results yeah. in a way. So it, it had a big impact. And so that might uh, modify also the shape of the functions of the three dimensional functions that you are showing us because it changes the values on the horizontal uh, and vertical axis, I guess. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, there is, I mean, certainly some evidence that one of the reasons Trump lost the election is the ineffectiveness of federal policies in this area and the absence of federal policies. So yeah, I think um, this certainly has had an impact on, on uh, domestic politics and probably was responsible for some states swinging from Republican to Democratic. Um, we haven't looked at that, no. It's an interesting point. Um, until this election, we didn't really have a good basis for deciding which states had swung. At this point, we do know that. You know, we can see that Pennsylvania has changed, that Wisconsin has changed, that uh, Michigan has changed, a couple of other, Arizona has changed, for example, um, and Nevada has changed. So those are some important swing states. So I could, we, we could go back in and look at a different, categorization of the states. Um, to endogenize fully the, um, the classification of states would be quite difficult. I can't immediately see how to do that. It would be an interesting thing to think about, but I can't quite see how to do that. I, I can, however, see that we could possibly like, change the classification at some point during the summer uh, to, you know, from, the 19, from the 2016 classification to the 2020 classification. Um, and see what that does to the estimation. Uh, that might be an interesting thing to try and do. And that's that's that yeah, that's a good idea. That, that's something we could do very easily. I could you know we get get that done in the next couple of days. Um, but to, to endogenize the the classification of a state as democratic or republican, I'd have to think more about exactly how one would do that. It would require more of a, a more complex model than we've got here, I think. Um, 
But there's also an interesting question, um, and, and, and you're certainly right intuitively that this has affected uh, which states are Republican and which states are Democratic. Yeah, absolutely. Good yeah, point. More than, endogenized, uh, more than endogenized, probably it's about the political shift that this might have caused. Because you are yeah, mentioning right. data from uh, Clinton versus uh, Trump, yeah. and so I thought, well, you have new data now you can rely well, on. So that, yeah, since, since, since November, we've had some new data. Yeah, yeah. Let me just make a note yeah. of that. Well, Sergio, I might have other questions, but I prefer to leave the stage to other questions. And then if there is uh, some time left, uh, I'll come sure. back. Okay? Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, if you want after, uh, if you have other questions, you can do. Okay, okay, now I leave the floor to uh, Fulvio Fontini, which is my next uh, for uh, asking. Fulvio, you. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you fine. Excellent, thank you. Um, because essentially you set up a, a model which is a static one, not a dynamic one. Uh, the empirical work, uh, may refer to a process which is um, inherently dynamic uh, in the sense that the, the, the theoretical model supposes that the decision is taken ex ante for optimal reasons or to optimize over time while it is well possible and not, not too familiar with the US policy but it's well possible that a state when deciding whether to adopt or not a policy um, take some time in, uh, in, in taking this decision and they probably don't take this decision all together at the same time. Um, so my question is uh, how would you uh, readapt the model to take into account the dynamics of the model um, uh, and, uh, and then um, if one possibility to do so also to, to make it coherent with the uh, empirical part is to uh, allow for the empirical part the decision to be not a binary decision or but a triple in the sense that uh, um, the state at some point could decide to adopt could decide not to adopt or could decide to wait and see uh, if in a subsequent stage whether to adopt or not now of course this would make the model much more complex even in a in a static form, but would probably yeah. take into account also some of the comments that Rafael posed about the fact that the, um, the, the, the decisions were taken at different points in time, while the model is essentially a static one. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just shared my screen again, and I'm just showing you actually the last slide I had, which I didn't in fact go through. One I was, says, you know, what, what, what do we still need to do? And one of the things I put there is model this as a repeated game rather than a sequence of, of one-shot games. Um, and that's right. I mean, I think that would be a nice thing to do. That's unfortunately quite a complicated thing to do. Um, and I haven't really got to grips with that yet. Um, this has been quite a busy semester, so I haven't got much research done the semester. But, um, but I think that I, I would like to look at the dynamics of this process and look at it in more in the context of a, of a, of a repeated game as opposed to a sequence of one-shot games. And the other thing we're thinking about doing is trying to endogenize the case rate. Uh, that's a little bit different from what Simone was suggesting. Simone suggested endogenizing the definition of democratic and republican. But I think that there's also a case for endogenizing the case rate as well, um, which we haven't tried to do. Um, so those are, uh, yeah, I, I, so I'm basically completely agreeing with you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's been nice things to do. We just haven't got around to doing them. And I'm not even certain that we can do them. They may just be a little bit too complex to do and, and remain sort of empirically testable. Thank you. Okay, F thank you Fulvio Fontini from the University of Padua. Uh, also Fulvio was at, at the, our conference in, uh, in Brescia. Now we have oh. a, 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 an email, uh, sorry, a, um, a question that uh, uh, should be on your screen uh, that is uh, written. Otherwise I can Right, yeah, right. do you control for weather and temperature variables if mask wearing policy has no impact on COVID-19 cases and policy adoption is a political decision? What kind of evidence motivates public health experts on these policies? So, um, no, we don't control for weather and temperature variables. We've certainly got those, but we haven't controlled for them. Um, we have tried a lot of other variables. We've, we've, I mean, I, <clears throat> we've done a lot of robustness checks using as I think I think I mentioned different definitions of, of democratic and republican we put a lot of other variables on the right hand side 
and uh, found they have relatively little impact. For example, we have looked, we have tried to control for the, um, for example, the uh, demographic composition of states. You know, some states are largely have largely white collar jobs where it's easy to work from home. Some states have largely blue collar jobs where it's much more difficult to work from home. Um, so that the economic costs are quite different in a white collar state from in a blue collar state, let's say, um, and much less. So we've tried to control for that. We can get data on that fairly easily, but that's, has, that tends not to have much impact on the regressions. We haven't tried weather and temperature. Um, we could look at that, but that probably has, is probably subsumed into the uh, number of new cases. And insofar as weather and temperature have an impact, they would be uh, subsequently reflected in the number of new cases in our state, uh, which is a function of those things. But we could certainly try looking at that. Um, what kind of evidence motivates public health experts to these policies? So the evidence that public health experts work with is, is in a lot of cases, um, experimental evidence. I mean, there have been quite a lot of experiments now where uh, public health experts have, um, have simulated uh, the, uh, the exhaling of droplets uh, by people who are talking, sneezing, laughing, coughing, singing, things of that sort, and actually uh, track these droplets through the air using very, very high speed, high resolution cameras to see how long they remain in the air and how far they travel in the air. And in particular, they've done this for droplets of the size which would carry virus particles. Um, and they found that these, these, these droplets remain in the air for several minutes and they can travel up to 15 or 20 feet. So, you know, five, six meters, something like that. Um, and they can remain in the air for anywhere from a couple of minutes to five minutes or something, in some cases even more than that. Um, so their recommendation of, of wearing masks is to is because of that, because they're aware these, these particles remain in the air and can travel quite a long way through the air. And if, if you come into contact with that air and breathe it in, you may breathe in enough of the particles to actually pick up the disease. So, um, if I wear a mask, the probability of my exhaling these particles is greatly reduced. And if you wear a mask, your probability of you taking them in, addition on my exhaling them is also greatly reduced. I mean, the good masks can be sort of 70, 80, 90% effective in reducing uh, the chances of a viral particle uh, coming into your, your respiratory system. So that's where the evidence is, essentially. That's experimental evidence rather than epidemiological evidence. There is, I think, somewhat epidemiological evidence also from Korea and Japan, uh, where quite strict policies have been put in place. There's been a great deal of tracking of, 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 of testing and contact tracing and looking at who was wearing a mask and who wasn't at the times when they interacted. And I think there's some empirical evidence from, there's a couple of papers been published recently by South Korean epidemiologists. I think they're on the Social Science Research Network website uh, where they claim some evidence uh, in, that supports the effectiveness of mask wearing policies from epidemiological basis. But most of the US evidence is, is experimental. Okay, I have a, an, um, a question more general, more general after I leave uh, also the floor to, to, again to Simone Borghesi for a, a last question so we can go to conclusion. But the question is, uh, is a more general. So the idea is, uh, I think that uh, um, unfortunately, because of the, the cause is uh, related to uh, COVID-19, but uh, COVID-19 also stressed the system in order to test also the uh, political reaction. No? In your paper, you are uh, focusing on the, the role of, of, of political, political role uh, in order to have a, a, to have a, re a reaction with respect to the COVID-19. So the, the role of a policy orientation is a strong, a stronger in, than other cases. So uh, moving uh, again in uh, environmental econ economics and so on, but uh, more now more related to climate change. Now today, uh, European Union decided to, uh, to 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 push in the direction of uh, uh, um, 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 recovery fund and uh, um, next generation EU. Uh, with uh, a huge amount of money in the idea of a uh, Green New Deal. No? So the idea is uh, how could be this political uh, role of the uh, European Union in order to push uh, uh, the, syst the global system in, in uh, facing uh, the problem of climate change? And the same, uh, the same question is uh, the new election on the on, uh, US. So the new change, there is a new, uh, in this case, uh, in this situation, uh, we have, uh, we have a, a new situation of political 
um, uh, position uh, after COVID-19. I think uh, this could be also an effect. It could be also linked with the idea of uh, Simone, Simone. So uh, I think there is a underutilization of uh, the problem. This was pushed uh, also by COVID-19. We have to say that uh, we have to say that in, uh, in uh, European Union we started also before COVID, uh, because a Green New Deal started uh, the last year, no, before uh, the pandemic effect. But uh, the new direction could be. So, how could be the the, the 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 role of policy in order now the new role of policy in order to face uh, the climate change and, and so if it could be a good uh, example for other one, we could have uh, the same effect on uh, one one-to-one -one, uh, role also for the other countries. I don't know if it's clear, the question. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a question, it's an issue I've thought a lot about. I don't, I don't know that I have any really short answers or, or, or interesting answers. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I am encouraged by the number of countries that are now committing to significant uh, reduction in emissions by the middle of the century. I mean, Biden has committed to the US to be carbon neutral by 2050. The European Union is making a similar commitment. The United Kingdom has made a commitment like that. A lot of countries are now committing to be carbon neutral, uh, quote unquote, by 2050. Now that's very encouraging. Um, it's something which hasn't happened before. Um, and I think that um, COVID-19 is, is probably gonna have a positive effect in terms of uh, encouraging commitments like this, but I think it's, it will ultimately lead people to take scientific warnings a bit more seriously. I mean, scientists have been warning about the possibility of a pandemic and the capacity of a pandemic to uh, to wreak havoc, and you know that's been shown. I mean, the, 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 it would be very difficult. You know, you have to have a vivid imagination to think of a, of a pandemic having the kind of effect that COVID nineteen has had. Um, and it's, it's had a remarkable impact. So I think that people will be inclined to take scientific warnings a bit more seriously. We've also had all had a taste of clean air. Uh, in big cities, the air has been much, much cleaner. And I think that that's probably encouraged the population to see that the, you can actually have much cleaner air. Um, but I think, and I think that, um, you know, I, so I do think, I think that the, the, um, the fact that so many countries are coming out in favor of carbon neutrality is very positive. You know, it, words are cheap for politicians, obviously. You know, politicians have a habit of promising and not delivering. Uh, so I think it's up to the population to hold them to their words. But the fact that they're saying these things, at least, is, is very encouraging. And I think that the, um, as I said, I think that COVID will ultimately have a small positive effect because it will make people take scientific warnings more seriously. And it will show that, um, for example, that what we're doing now, um, it would never, we'd never have thought about this before COVID, would we? We never have thought of having an international seminar like this one. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm next week I'm giving a talk in Paris, quote unquote. Um, and not so long ago, I gave a talk in, in Sweden um, without any traveling at all. So obviously there's going to be less air travel by the time when, when COVID-19 uh, is finally cured. Um, I don't think I'll jump on a plane and go to a meeting in, in Asia or in Europe uh, with the same, in the same way as I used to. I think a lot of those meetings will be like in this kind of format. Uh, we'll still travel a bit, but not, not quite as much. So I think there'll be a consequences for long-term travel. And also, I mean, a lot of, in the US, a lot of organizations have said they intend to keep a big fraction of their labor force working from home now, even when the epidemic is gone. And a lot of the banks have suddenly discovered that they can, that popular, their, their employees can perfectly well work from home for at least three or four days a week. Um, and maybe just come into the office once once a week or once every couple of weeks for coordination meetings. And that will lead to a big drop in commuting. Uh, there's a, you know, obviously has been a huge drop in commuting, but the, the point is that's gonna remain in place uh, when the COVID is, 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 is finished, I think. So I think there will be big changes in travel habits. And as uh, here in the US, travel is the biggest single source of greenhouse gases now. You know, about roughly 30% of all emissions comes from travel as opposed to 28% from electricity production. Uh, so a uh, big reduction in travel will be a, a huge plus as far as greenhouse gases are concerned. So yeah, I think there's a there's a positive effect here. Absolutely, small but positive. Okay, thank thank you, Jeffrey. Perfect. So we okay. we are perfect in time. So I would like to thank you very much. It was a, an honor and a pleasure to to have Jeffrey in our seminar. Also, thank you very much. And so we will continue to with the next uh, seminar. Thank you. Very My pleasure. Great meeting you all. Thank you. Thank you.